And um, we are recording now, Dr. Kaufman, so we are good. Um, welcome everybody to Conversations with CAGT. My name is Dr. Colleen Ehrlich and I am the president of CAGT and it's my pleasure to be here tonight facilitating this Conversations with CAGT. Um, before we get started, just a few um, announcements. The CAGT conference, the keynotes, the signature series, the breakout sessions, all of those are still available through May. If you're not registered, then you're able to still register on our website. And if you are enjoying the conversations with CAGT, we'd love to have you become a member of CAGT. This year, unlike years in the past, um, we are not having a conference because we are hosting NAGC here in November. And typically people become a member through um, attending and registering, um, registering and attending for our conference. This year, that won't be the case. And so if you want to stay a member of CAGT, then just visit our website and you can register to become a, a member there today. And then next week for our conversations with CAGT, we've got Dr. Jaime Castellano, who will be our guest speaker, so we're excited for him. But today, we are welcoming Dr. Felice Kaufman to our conversations with CAGT. And just a little bit about Dr. Kaufman. So Dr. Felice Kaufman is an independent consultant in gifted child education. She received her master's degree from Columbia Teachers College and her doctorate from the University of Georgia, where she spent four years as a research assistant to the legendary Dr. E. Paul Torrance. Felice has been a classroom teacher and a counselor of gifted children, grades K through 12, and a professor at Auburn University and the universities of New Orleans and Kentucky, where she created teacher training programs in gifted child education. She has been on the board of directors of the National Association for Gifted Children and the executive board of the Association for the Gifted. She was also the director of the National Training Program in Gifted Education for the Council for Exceptional Children. Felice has presented workshops and keynote addresses across the United States, Canada, Europe, and Australia. Her articles have appeared in such journals as Journals for Education of the Gifted, Roper Review, Journal of Career Education, Journal of Counseling and Development, and Exceptional Children and Gifted Child Today. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Kaufman, who will be speaking on stories from the rear view mirror, what educators and parents can learn from the lives of gifted adults. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Uh, I would be remiss if I did not start this talk by acknowledging the incredible work that you all have done this year, uh, both acknowledging and appreciating and respecting what you've been through. Um, it's just been an unbelievable year and the work that educators and parents are doing right now is something unimaginable. And I just, I just want to express, if you have not been thanked today by anybody, let me be the first to thank you. This has really been quite something. Let me tell you about um, the presentation that I've drawn up for today. I was very excited to be involved with, with this group and to be able to bring my work to you. Um, for the past 40 years, I've been doing a study that might be entitled, Whatever Happened to the Class Of. Um, it's a longitudinal study of the early presidential scholars and it's really to answer the question that's been burning in me for many years of what happens to gifted kids through time. You know, we all as, as teachers and parents are trained to do things. We, we, you know, we come to meetings, we listen to lectures about what to do, we enact strategies. But it's always been, you know, a concern of is anything that we do worth it over the long haul? I actually got interested, amazingly, in longitudinal research, my, my interest can be documented to age three, amazingly. Um, the story was that um, I grew up in Chicago, right near the train, uh, the Illinois Central. And as any three-year-old is, I used to be very excited about trains. You know, I would sit and I'd watch them go by back and forth and back and forth. And my mother said that the question I always asked was when the caboose showed up and you know kids get very excited about the caboose i always wondered what was the caboose going to be like when it grew up so apparently i've been interested in longitudinal research since i was three years old um, i got interested further as i grew into adulthood and became a teacher wondering you know what does happen to these kids after they leave our you know our classrooms you know do they, are they successful does anything stick with them so I was very lucky in that I had an association with a group called the Presidential Scholars. 
which is a federally funded ongoing organization that honors excellence and achievement in high school kids. In the early years, uh, that is the president, um, the Presidential Scholars was begun in 1964 by uh, President Lyndon Johnson. So it's not like the Presidential Scholars of a University. This is the Presidential Scholars with a capital P. Johnson began this program in 1963 as a response, little known fact, as a response to the Kennedy assassination. Um, I'm imagining that most of you are not alive during that time. But after the Kennedy assassination, this country fell into despair, like, like just unimaginable despair. And he and his advisors got together to decide what kind of program might enliven or give hope to America for the future. So they hit on the idea of honoring excellence and outstanding achievement in high school kids. So what they did in order to get the presidential scholars to identify them, as we would say in the field, is they screened out the top, um, top one half of 1% of all the high school seniors who were taking the SATs that year, the high school juniors, no, the high school seniors, sorry. And that was roughly 14,000 kids who were in this pool of incredibly talented, brilliant children who were very, very high achievers. And their test scores and other information such as um, teacher recommendations, such as autobiographical statements, other test scores, et cetera, were submitted to a screening committee. It, it was just like any other gifted program. It was um, an identification program. The likes of that committee, however, were people like Leonard Bernstein, the famous you know, conductor, Catherine Ann Porter, the famous writer, an early astronaut. It was a very glitzy group of about 10 people who essentially holed up at the White House. Remember, this is pre-internet. So I don't know if any of you remember the world pre-internet, but there was no just sending off these these dossiers to people and having them look at it in the privacy of their home. They actually had to come to Washington and they stayed for about three and a half weeks reading these 14,000 applications, after which one boy and one girl from every state and 15 kids who they called scholars at large. And that were situations like um, kids living in poverty who really didn't have access to a lot of resources, but they really made something of themselves anyway. It was kids um, who were living abroad kids who were living in situations like where their, their bedrooms were in Colorado and their bathrooms were in, you know, Wyoming or Utah. And I'm, not, I'm not familiar enough with Western geography. I hope one of those works. But you know, unusual situations. And 121 kids then were uh, invited to become presidential scholars. And the recognition was that these kids were flown to Washington for three days for incredible recognition, for meetings with their Congress people, at that time congressmen, uh, with their senators, with officials around Washington, there were cocktail parties, there were just, it was an amazing celebration of achievement in young people. And then it culminated in a ceremony at the Rose Garden where they were given this medal, this Presidential Scholars Medal, and told by the President of the United States and have been every year since, the Presidential Scholars Program is still going on, that they were gonna be the future of America and we were counting on them to lead us into a positive future. And then they were sent home, um, basically to never be heard of again until this graduate student at the University of Georgia who had been privileged to be a house mother at the Presidential Scholars meetings in Washington, got to wondering what happens to kids when they're told that they're gonna be the best, smartest, that they're the smartest kid in the country and they're gonna lead us into the future. What does that do to a kid and how do these lives get lived out? So I set out to do that study and it started by my driving in my old car up to Washington thinking I was gonna spend the weekend Look at, you know, just getting the names and addresses of presidential scholars because I had imagined that this being the future of America, that the offices here in Washington would have kept tabs on these kids. So I figured, well, no problem. I'll get the addresses. I'll go back to Georgia. I'll write my dissertation. Job well done. Au contraire, what happened was got in my car, drove to Washington, 
got to the Office of Gifted and Talented where these, um, these, these files were supposed to be, only to find out that not only were the files not updated, they didn't even know where the files were. So I ended up not spending a weekend, but I spent a year and a half in Washington trying to locate the first five years of the Presidential Scholars. And let me say again, this was pre-internet. So I spent this year and a half trying to find these people mostly, but not always through legal means. And if we weren't on camera, I would tell you some of the things I did to find them because I have to say they were pretty creative. And just through sheer persistence, just sheer persistence and sometimes really good luck. And I'm telling you, for those of you who are interested in numbers, because this is not gonna be a statistical talk, but if you're interested in the numbers, of these 604 original presidential scholars, I actually found 551 of them pre-internet, which PS, I thought I should have gotten my PhD for just for that. It really was quite an achievement. And then of the 551 who I located, 325 pretty much divided equally between males and females and from all over the country agreed to be part of a study. And so over the past, almost 50 years now, the past 40, I'm, I'm stunned saying that, but over the past 45 years, 325 of them have pretty much stuck with me as I've sent them questionnaires and I've done personal interviews. And it's, it's really been the only thing I've done in my career. I'm kind of embarrassed to admit that, but it's true. But that's because I learned so much just from studying lives. For those of you who are researchers, this was not hypothesis driven. I was not looking to prove anything. I just, I'm a gossip. I mean, I love people's life stories. I love soap operas. I wish I could learn every one of your stories and find out how you got from there to here. I mean, this is, I live for stories. So this was mainly about getting the stories of these 325 presidential scholars. And I did. So everything that I have learned up till now in my career basically has been simply from studying the lives of these people asking, so what worked for you? What happened? Um, you will never hear me say the words, well, the presidential scholars as a group, because honestly, even from all the data that I collected and there was massive data here, there wasn't even, there wasn't stuff that was that interesting. You know, it, males and females, I did that study they were pretty much equivalent in their later life achievement. The only statistic that was outstanding, but not surprising, and I know you're waiting for this, was the salaries that over time, even though there are as many male as female physicians, male as female lawyers, male as female unemployed, it was a complete range of equality, except in the area of salary and men consistently made at every level more than women. But that's really the only number that was particularly interesting. However, the stories are really where the learning is. So I thought that for tonight, if you'll indulge me, I would simply tell you stories and what I learned from them. And I think the best way, honestly, for you to learn from me is not to be listening for what is she saying about the presidential scholars or about gifted children, but really to listen through the filter of one gifted kid that you're concerned about, whether you're a parent or a teacher, and to ask yourself in what ways is what I'm saying relevant to that child? Because maybe it'll give you some insight into why these kids are the way they are. And that if, if I do nothing but give you insight into like one insight into one kid, I'll feel like I've done something. And at the end of this, um, I promised myself, and I'm not so good at keeping time, but I promised myself that I would cut it off quickly enough that I can also suggest to you about nine or 10 teaching and parenting strategies that I gleaned from this work. Um, so that at least you walk away with a few concrete things that that you can actually do and apply. And then of course, we're gonna have time for questions. So let me start by, and I'm gonna to have to be reading. I, I, I've never done this kind of thing before with the screen. So I, I do apologize for reading, but that's the way you're gonna get the stories. Pretend like I'm reading you a bedtime story or something, okay? But don't fall asleep because there's stuff good, that's good in here. Um, I would say that one of the main things I learned from this study is to make sure with any kid that you're thinking about, 
that you realize that there's much more to them than their giftedness. You know, we tend to get so dazzled sometimes by how gifted these kids are that we tend to forget that there's other stuff going on in their life. And that giftedness can have different meaning, both in a familial and cultural context. And that's important, the individual, the familial, and the cultural context. So let me start by reading you this one story. There's a woman who is uh, a psychologist, very, very well known in the Northeast, who writes the following about being gifted. She writes, when I was in third grade, a nun at the school I was attending told my parents in a very stern tone, you know your daughter is very smart, which made my mother feel there might be something bad about this. I always excelled at school, but at the same time, I felt there was something suspect in being smart because as my mother said, it could lead to the sin of pride, okay? So by middle school, I started to hide my successes. I became extremely self-conscious whenever I made a mistake or needed to ask a question as the rest of the class would go, ooh, in a sort of hushed tone. It took me many, many years to be able to ask questions freely. I assumed that not to know an answer was a terrible, humiliating failure. Even in my career, I was so used to holding back that I had no understanding or experience with competition, including what to do when faced with it. Somehow I did it okay, but I would have gotten a lot more out of life without that burden. In other words, it's important to understand, again, the context in which the giftedness lives and to make sure that you get an understanding of what being gifted means to the individual child. It's not all about, oh, goody, I'm in a gifted program. Or, oh, I'm smart. There's a whole barrage of layers that can go along with being, being identified as gifted. And I think it's really important to keep that in mind. There was another one that really affected me deeply. Um, and it, it speaks to the fact that sometimes children who are gifted are not allowed to really express what's going on in other parts of their life because the assumption is that, are gift, that if they're gifted, they can handle it. So this is a woman who actually is an activist minister in your part of the world. And I really had to think about how gifted kids, I hate to use the word abuse because it's so powerful, but how gifted kids can, can in a way be overlooked because their gifts shine so brightly that they're not seen for, for in their entirety. So this woman wrote, there were four children in our family. The youngest was born when I was six, and he was proud, profoundly disabled. He started having grand mal seizures when I was seven, and if, I, if, if, I, if he went into a seizure, mom would say, you take care of the kids, and she would throw a coat over her nightgown and run to the hospital. She might be gone six hours. I was seven, and there was a five-year-old and a three-year-old, and I was in charge. You're so smart, she used to say as she was leaving. You can handle it. So I became a very mature child. Teachers love a mature child. By comparison to home, school was so easy. All I had to do was what was assigned, be cheerful. In high school, I'd be one of the first people in the building in the morning and always the last to leave. I just couldn't face going home. And then I get, I, oh gosh, I get choked up when I read this. And then she writes, shouldn't somebody have noticed? Oh, sorry. How embarrassing to choke up on screen. Oh my God. I'm really sorry. But that poignance, sorry again, of somebody should have noticed. So when, again, when you're seeing a gifted kid, you have to see beyond just their giftedness. You have to look at faces. You have to look at behaviors, not just the gifted behavior, because there might be things going on that they can be so smart that they won't really be seen for who they are. Let me check my time to make sure that my weepiness didn't affect anybody. Um, here was another one that uh, was sort of related to, to being seen as gifted, which is you can't assume anything about what a kid is going to be gifted in. Um, I actually met this guy here in Washington. He was playing in a bar, <laughs> playing piano. And I went up to him and said, excuse me, but were you a presidential scholar when you were 17? And both of us almost fainted. It was astonishing. I love little vignettes like that that have come out of the study that have been so cool. He writes, and I, this again, it, it just put me away, this whole thing. He said, I remember a time in fifth grade that I got really interested in the Roman Empire. I wrote a paper on it and got so excited that I copied the name of every Roman Empire onto the paper. 
They were cool Latin names, but my teacher wrote, aren't we being a bit pedantic? I had no idea what pedantic meant. And when I asked her, she said, you know where the dictionary is. So I went to the dictionary and it said something like overly showing one's knowledge. I felt very bad about it. It was certainly not what I had intended to do. The reason I did it, I was so excited about it. And that sort of set things in motion. He said, by the time I was in junior high, there was a hint of my being smart, but it was covered somewhere. You can understand why he had to cover it. That kind of shame, I mean, no one has really, to my knowledge, studied the effect of shame in gifted kids. But I have to tell you, it was a theme in this study that was quite surprising to me. But he wrote, by the time I was in junior high, there was a hint of my being smart, but it was covered somewhere. And again, you can understand why he felt like he had to cover it. In high school, I flowered a bit more. I got out of the nerdy bookish clique and into the smart kids clique. But the theater clique was where I really felt best. They were more like ordinary people. That to me was such a relief. It was okay in the theater group to be smart, but they all kind of loved me for it. They were like, he's our guy. He's really smart, but he hangs around with us. One of the things that I preach about, for lack of a better word, in that I, I really haven't heard a lot of people discuss, is the importance of helping gifted kids learn to be ordinary, helping them learn to be ordinary. Because when they get used to living their life as outstanding and gifted, when they get out into whatever the, the real world is, and there are not so many vehicles to be outstanding, and they're not so, you don't have a lot of times when people are praising you and honoring you all the time, and you're just one of a, a bunch of people, it's really hard to adjust. So they need models, not only for success, but also for how to just live an ordinary life. I think that's extremely important. Along those lines and along the lines of shame about their abilities, this other guy wrote, uh, he was an engineer at Bell Labs. He wrote, I've become very cynical about the meaning of life. I don't think it's possible to be happy without drugging oneself in one way or another. To live intensely in both pleasure and pain seems to be the best possible goal. I bring this up, and it's the reason I'm bringing this depressing one to you, by the way, as, as teachers and parents. I bring this up because I think the depths of my cynicism is directly related to my successful childhood. He said, if my childhood hadn't been so idyllic, I would not be so cynical now. I feel I was misled about the nature of life by my parents and teachers. It's much more grim than I ever expected. So I got to tell you, I broke protocol with this guy and I called him up. This was a few years ago. And I called him and I said, talk to me. What does this mean? And he brought up something that's actually been a big theme of mine, which was he was praised all the time for what a smart student he was, for how good he was, for how excellent his work is, was. And then when he got out of the formal system where things like praise and honors and awards just you know, I mean, think about how many times you walk in to your house and someone says, oh, it's just great to see you. You are so good at what you do, All right? Those levels of praise don't often happen. So you have to instead teach kids that their work has value, not to say that it's excellent and wonderful, but that it has value. And to me, that's one of the most important things that you can learn about. Um, how do you do that? I can tell you one thing Dr. Torrance used to talk about is that to teach a kid that their work has value, don't tell them that their work is excellent. Show them that you're interested in it. So in other words, instead of saying, oh, this is such a great project, you did a great job, you say something like, where, where did you get the idea for this? Or this is a very unusual conclusion. Can you tell me how you came up with it? It would The example I always use of this, if I may, um, is... If you've ever had an experience where you get up in the morning and you've got like some kind of virus, you know, hypothetically, of course, but you hit you, but you just feel awful and you look in the mirror and it's like, oh no. And you, you think, you know, I really just need some orange juice or chicken soup or whatever to, um, you know, just to feel better. So you run to the grocery store and you walk in, you think, oh, please, please let nobody see me who I know. And then you get to the checkout counter and someone comes up to you and says, oh my gosh, I haven't seen you in a while. You look wonderful. And you immediately think, oh, oh no. 
to think how different that would feel if in fact they came up to you and said, oh, we haven't seen each other in a long time. What have you been doing? Um, how is this? And they show you that, that you know, they're really interested in you. So I think that's a very important distinction to, is to just back off praise from a lot of kids, especially underachievers, and start showing them that their work has value and interest instead. The other thing along these lines, and I, I need to check to see, ah, I need to check about time. I could go on and on, as you can imagine, um, is you also have to look at achievement and giftedness in a cultural context. Um, children from poverty cultures often have very different uh, experiences of being gifted. People from different cultures have different experiences of being gifted. This is a guy who is actually... Um, he was my first experience of interviewing someone who was working in a very low level job. And it was my first encounter with, oh, you mean not all these people, you know, ascertain great heights, right? Um, he was working in customer service, um, you know, in, in phone, phone service, whatever. <laughs> that sounds bad, but you know what I mean? It's customer service. He wrote, about halfway through college, I was feeling very out of place being a working class boy in an owning class college and not experiencing the academic success which had come so early in high school. I went to the college psychologist to talk about this, but at the same time wasn't really aware of the impact that feeling out of place had on me. The psychologist got my file and said, well, considering where you came from, you're doing what we expect of you. I left his office feeling like someone had punched me in the stomach and essentially gave up on the whole academic experience. I could not drop out of college because it was my parents' dream. My parents never knew and still do not know how unhappy college made me and how hard it was to recover from it. And I'm sure they never suspected, nor do they still know what a wedge it drove between myself and my family. They just assumed it would be a good thing and give me a better life than they had. They had no way of really knowing what it did to me in the long run. This was a guy who never who never felt like he wanted to achieve. He never wanted to be outstanding because culturally, it was something that he couldn't overcome. So again, it's important to think about kids who are in cultures where sometimes being outstanding does not work in their favor. And only you know about that in the situation. This is hard. This is hard for me because I don't, I can't see you and I don't know enough about where you work, but it's really something to think about. Um, so the idea again is to normalize struggle for these kids at a very young age to be aware that there are struggles involved. Things don't always come easy. A great idea is to have them read biographies, but not of people's final accomplishments, of the struggles they faced when they were young kids. Um, when they're interviewing parents and grandparents, a lot of schools have assignments like that, not to say, oh, what did you accomplish, grandma? But what were the hard times? How did you get out of them? They need to know that struggling is normal. And for you as teachers to find out, again, what does giftedness mean in the individual, in the family, in the culture? Um, now I'm going to start hurrying more. I hope, I hope this is going to be okay. Another thing is to understand what success... Oh, you're I'm back. Dr. Hoffman, I'm just going to, don't worry about time. You're good. We started a little bit late. So you're okay. Good. I'm terrified, but all right. No, Thank you. <laughs> Thanks for that. <laughs> nice work. <laughs> Another one is about definitions of, of success and to understand again, that success means different things to different people, different, different cultures, et cetera. Um, bottom line, kids need, if you're going to underline anything I'm saying, this would be it. They, under, they need a variety of models for success, not just one type of success. So for example, there's this woman in my study who's written 23 science books, um, which takes my breath away, 23 science books, but get a load of what she wrote. She wrote, I get, she doesn't feel like an achiever at all. Did I mention 23 books? Yeah, it, it was astonishing to hear her talk about not feeling like she achieved anything. She wrote, I guess, she wrote, I guess my feeling about achievement hasn't really changed. I still demand the equivalent of straight A's for myself, even though I know in real life you won't get all A's the way you did in school. My mother said I had great potential and that it was a shame I never realized it. Did I mention 23 books? My rational side thinks she's wrong, but my emotional side suspects she's right. 
I just kind of lived life as it came. My definition of success is dying, you know, is dying knowing that you had one hell of a fun ride. I can do that. So I think you have to be very careful about how you define success for kids. For example, how often do we talk about fun as a measure of success? So I think that what's needed here is a multiple definition of success that's not reliant on traditional versions of success, i.e. good grades, a good salary, a prestigious position, et cetera. You need to have other factors that can 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 work as a, as a definition for someone who's trying to make sense of their life. This is another one of my favorites. Um, again, talking about different criteria, she wrote, um, and you'll I know some of you'll be able to relate to relate to this. She wrote, "I have been a full time stay at home mother of nine children for most of my post college life." I love what I do. I always have mothering, even when it mainly involves lots of cleaning toilets, doing laundry, cooking and dishes, even when it required many, many diaper changes and vomit cleanups. It's been a constant joy to me. I love children and my home has been and still is filled with them. Being allowed to teach in any capacity is an exciting challenge. I'm sure when she was a presidential scholar, she was not told that having nine children was a criteria of success in making a happy home, right? She writes, the time will come when I will go forward with another career or, or new horizons. I worry that I don't have the courage of youth anymore, the stamina for late night studying, the clear vision of what to do um, and the support of a youth oriented workplace. On the other hand, unlike my younger self, I'm starting from a later life definition of success. A happy home that I built for the family that belongs there, and also one that draws others in and embraces them as well. So again, multiple definitions for how a life can be lived, interviewing parents, grandparents about the entirety of their life, again, reading biographies and autobiographies of struggles and alternative ways of making yourself happy. This, this is another one. Um, he's not typical. Um, uh, he's a farmer. And what he writes was absolutely fascinating to me about achievement and what's important to life in life as people go on through the life cycle. He writes, the definition of success as being happy with what you've got, happy with what you've got, hasn't changed for me much over the years. Very different from presidential scholars and gifted education definition of success, right? I've always valued time as much as money. One change is that I value personal friendships and family more than I used to. He writes, achievement, nah. He said, I wish I'd had more fun in my 20s and 30s. I was pretty serious and worked very hard during those years. I wish I had instead developed better friendships with my teachers and classes and classmates. I did spend more time with my son as he was growing up than my father spent with me, but it's still not enough. He says, I recall a big snowstorm when we lived six miles out of town. My son's elementary school was canceled, but I struggled to drive into the office to work on a pressing project. I should have spent that day with my 10-year-old at home throwing snowballs. Now that would have been real success. So again, I think it's important that we find help kids and also ourselves find personal meaning in success, not just doing achievement for achievement's sake. So, I mean, I know it's tried to say it, but it's the process, not the product that you really have to emphasize with these kids and to make sure that if you're teachers, that you as many times as possible, allow kids to do assignments based on their special interests and strengths. And I know sometimes that's really hard to do when you've got a preset curriculum, but in any way that you can, it's really, really crucial that you do that. And actually to, again, to watch how you praise them and to ask them questions about their work rather than just you know heap praise on them. And then the last thing comes, uh, the last point that I wanna make is about a definition of success. Someone asked me that. And I'm actually still working on that definition, but it's predicated by the responses and the insights I've gotten from some of these people. My current definition, and this is gonna make some of you faint dead away, I have to say. This, this is not what you're expecting from someone who spent 45 years in gifted education. But I'm gonna tell you anyway, because that's why I'm here. Um, my definition of success is knowing what your needs are and knowing how to get them met 
without hurting anybody. Very different angle. And let me do a couple of examples again for why you need different models of success for these kids. Um, let's see, this one, this one was really interesting. <laughs> she wrote, <laughs> sorry, I tell myself jokes all the time about this. When I was a presidential scholar, I thought what I really needed in life was to set the world on fire. Then she writes, actually, I'm thankful I didn't set my hair on fire. <laughs> Sorry. Um, she said, I married the wrong man and it lasted 20 years. The greatest tragedy of my life was not that it failed, but that it succeeded so well. My divorce is one of my greatest accomplishments for the first time I was be able to say, he, hey, this is who I am. This is what I want. This is what I need but they don't give awards for that. See, if I were, if I were made queen of awards, I would be giving awards for self-knowledge. And I know that sounds paradoxical, but if I were gonna be praising kids, it's for, for knowing what their real needs are and knowing good ways to get those needs met. She said, when I realized I would not set the world on fire, I determined that what I really wanted and needed all along was to spread what warmth and life I could into my little corner of it. So am I successful, she writes, yeah. So here's another one, and this, this was an interesting guy. I, I'm only gonna read two more because um, my time is really getting short. This is a guy who was a physician who turned artist. He had a career crisis and turned to art. He writes, everyone hears all the advice, work hard, be good to others, kindness counts. Stay moved, uh, stay roaded in your committee and do honest work, but no one really understands this till I get older. I certainly didn't. Just try and do what you really like and are good at. You have to live with who you are and what you've done. Success is feeling okay about the general trajectory of your life, despite the parts which were not well done or not done at all. I went into medicine due to the internalization of expectations. It has been okay but I might have been, done better and felt more fulfilled in a more creative endeavor. I used to have the feeling of needing to move forward on many fronts of life at once, but now I know that no one is remembered for very long. Focus on helping the next generation. Don't kill or harm unnecessarily. Focus on what you enjoy. Focus on helping the next generation. Don't, uh, I'm sorry, uh, be, be as good as your word and figure out what you really need out of life whether there are awards and recognition there or not. So again, it's a real plea for you to expand your definition of success and your models for success into more of a need driven definition. And then I'm just gonna read one more because I love it so much. And, and I, I hope this will be a kind of like a kinder gentle way of, of, of ending my part of the talk. This was a guy, it was just, I, I was so charmed by this. He wrote, this may sound silly, but when I was assigned by my New York based law firm, he was in a really high power law firm to work in Brussels, in the Brussels office. I spent a month taking in Fre intensive French language turning in La Rochelle. I was worried that taking a month off would interfere with my work to the point that it made me ill to think about leaving, but I was assured through this that this would not affect my pending promotion. One weekend I was driving around the countryside and I had a very nice lunch at a country restaurant, including a raspberry tart for dessert. On leaving, I saw that a local farmer had pulled up an old Citroen mini truck and was unloading trays of raspberries. I was absolutely transfixed, he writes, to the point that all I had ever thought about was climbing as far as possible up the ladder of achievement. But that moment made me think that maybe one should care more about just enjoying life. While I remained ambitious for many years thereafter, I think I became decidedly less driven than I once was and have happily always dated the change to that Sunday lunch in the French, in the French countryside. So I guess you can understand that my plea here is for an expanded definition of success an expanded definition of giftedness. And um, I think what I'll do is just, I made a list of some strategies I didn't want to um, exclude, but now here's where you come back in. Do I have time to do that or you just want to do questions? Oh, absolutely, go ahead and share them. Oh, this is I exciting, we, I thank you. All, I think we'd all love to hear them. <laughs> oh my gosh, okay, well, I'm in, I'm in. Some of them may be repetitive. I'm just gonna read you from a list that I published a long time ago. Um, 
This you got encouraged, and I'm just gonna read, I'll do a dramatic reading of the list, how's that? Um, encourage, and I can barely see it, but I'm sorry. So encourage students to make connections between their personal and school lives. I love doing show and tell with kids, even in high school, so that they, they bring in something they love to the school building. So they start associating feelings of personal connection to school because they're showing and telling what really cares about them. So showing and telling, I would schedule a regular show and tell time if I were a teacher still. Um, doing free writing, um, a allowing kids to, to take subjects that are assigned, but write them either in a style or about topics that are close to them. One of the highest forms, this is my other hat, one of the highest forms of creativity is something called remote associations. So even if you're doing something and the kids have a weird hobby, if you can say, well, let's think of ways that, you know, the War of 1812 connects to tap dancing or something, you know, whatever it is to get them to get what they're energetically excited about associated with going to school and with curriculum. Um, another is to find out, we talked about this, what achievement in school means to them in their context of their family, their ethnic group, et cetera. You can do this through sentence completion, free writing, focus groups, interviews, or studying biographies of their heroes and heroines of their own group, right? And make sure that those people are relevant to them. Help them find a meaningful connection to school, something they can look forward to every day. This means meaningful to them. Um, and again, show and tell, hobby club, um, at, you know, free time, et cetera, um, will help them feel more connected. Involving them in service projects. There's nothing that helps a kid see their value than being of service to others. And, and underachievers don't often have a chance to do that kind of thing. Um, so to the extent that you can get them involved in service, that would be great because then they feel that's an expansion of their identity. Um, find a way of recognizing small achievements. Um, this comes from the, the work that I did on underachievement, also from presidential scholars who always felt that they had to do something dramatic to be recognized and that small achievements weren't worth it. You may have heard this. Um, I started lecturing about this around 30 years ago, something called the bug roll, B-U-G, which is a counterpart to the honor roll. And bug stands for bringing up grades, where kids are recognize somehow when they bring their grades up, like from a C to a C plus. And that, that helps kid understands that the way to, to success is those small incremental success. It doesn't have to be where it's, it's necessarily a big deal, but just that you notice when they go up incrementally in something. Um, teach the art of mistake making. You know, I used to do when I was teaching units on mistake making, there are all kinds of wonderful books written now about, I'd love to think it was because, you know, I carried on about it, but I know it's not me. Um, but there are all kinds of wonderful books about mistake making out. I, I did a quick search before I got online here. And um, I think it'd be worth, you're looking at about art of making mistakes, et cetera. Interviewing, you know, grandma, grandpa, mom, dad, other classmates about the worst mistake they ever made, how they came out of it. It's just the idea that mistakes are in fact a learning, uh, you know, something to learn about. Um, actually, one of the things that I used to do when I was in charge of science fairs is to make one of the criteria for science fairs that you had to also present the times the volcano didn't erupt and you had to keep a log of all the times you know, that the science fair project was not a success. When you only have successful projects, kids get intimidated. And they think they have to do the best project and something that's fabulous, that's not true. So if you can figure out a way to incorporate mistakes into the success process, that would be terrific. Um, I used to call it the ones that got away, but that's just me. Um, uh, let's see. Keeping an idea trap. I don't know if you've been taught that in any of your creative, your creativity classes, that you make sure that every kid has a way of, you know, the kid who always has the great idea and they're interrupting and, and you know, to have them have a way for writing down their creative ideas when they're happening. And then at the end of the week, for example, instead of interrupting, you know, you could say, all right, everyone bring out your idea traps and let's, let's talk about all the good ideas you had. 
And this is all based on presidential scholar stuff. I know it sounds like I'm talking about something completely different. This is all based on things I took away from the study. Or you could even do like group idea traps, uh, you know, that when kids get good ideas that they write them on the board. And then, you know, every Friday we talk about all the ideas you had. Again, when the presidential scholars reported not really being able to be themselves all the time because so many expectations were put on them, this gives them the opportunity to get those other parts of themselves out. Um, I think that's about it. I think it's about, let me, let me make sure you have time for questions. How's that? Does that work? I'm so sorry. I'm just, no, that's, I'm just, that's perfect. Thank you so much. And ah. I think, uh, you know, I would just echo a lot of what people have said in the comments that you're, the anecdotes you shared are very poignant and. Oh, good. Um, I'm so glad. Sorry yeah. for stabbing my face no. off, but yeah. <laughs> and I loved what you said at the beginning that, um, you know, to kind of just set the tone for this entire presentation that listen through the filter of one gifted child that you're thinking yeah. about. And I think that that just really helps ground the context of what you're saying. Yeah, I mean, so, I hope if one person gets one idea about one kid, you know, I'll feel like I've done my job here. Oh, absolutely, I have, absolutely. And so we have had a few questions. So we did have a couple of questions coming from some membership and I, I you've answered some of them already. Um, okay. so the first one was around what were some of the social emotional relationships that were explored that you have talked about quite a bit. And then also how do you define success? And you gave that, um brilliant kind of answer that knowing what your needs are and knowing how to get them met without hurting anyone that might actually be the best definition of success that i have ever oh my God. i was not gonna even say that yeah it's no. So weird no it's it's great i think there's so much you. conversation like people talk about potential and they talk about <laughs> everything and like what is somebody's potential and how do you measure that but this um Knowing that, right? The the amount of like self reflection and um, it's all about need meeting. Yeah, see that has to go into that. All of those things that so many of us are all really working on building when we focus on that whole gifted child. So that definition certainly very much speaks. To oh, I could leap to the screen and hug you. Oh, we can't hug now, but thanks. <laughs> Um, we did have a couple other questions. So one more from membership and then we had some come through. So one was, um, did the uh, adult gifted individuals talk about regrets or things that they would have done differently as kids or adolescents? Yeah, I think the most important thing was more fun and you know they regretted not having more fun. And I, now I'm gonna put it into my words, not theirs, but I think that, not I think, I know, that a lot of them regretted that so much of their identity was predicated on being smart and better than. And, you know, when I, you know, I always tried when I used to give lectures, you know, I was on the circuit to talk about approaching gifted education is not better than, but different from. And I think that that's what really came through here is that, you know, it's the reason my work in other contexts was called Once Upon a Pedestal. And there is that, you know, I, I really live by that pedestal metaphor that some kids did fine when they fell off the pedestal. But, you know, once they're in a position when they're not really getting praise and awards and honors, um, I think the most important regret that they had is they didn't have enough experience with ordinary life to to feel good about themselves without external awards. So it's the internalization stuff. Does that answer your question? Yeah, I can't tell. Yeah, I absolutely. And I think, um, no, I think it very much does. And I, and I love that whole idea of not better than, but different from. And when you were talking about earlier that, you know, as, as people age, there's just not as many vehicles to be extraordinary, right? I think that's how you phrase it. And the it. value system also changes people, you know, and it's interesting because I'm still in touch with a lot of the subjects, even though I kind of, I haven't done the formal study and, you know, satisfaction with, with life and internal stuff is much more important. At around age 50, the interest there overall, and now they were... Well, they were in their early, in their, their mid sixties, the last formal study I did. And the whole emphasis on awards really was like, that's way in my past. And some people regretted that. And some people were fine with that. But again, they don't give, they don't, you know, when was the last time you got an award? You know, it's like, <laughs> it's, it's kind of hard, you know, not part of daily life anymore. Mm -hmm. 
So we have a couple of questions from um, Facebook from the chat box. So um, Kelly said, how do we redirect needs that may tend to be negative or unhealthy? So I think that's coming back to that whole definition of success. So knowing what your needs are and knowing how to get them without hurting anyone. What if they don't know what their needs are or if they are? Oh, I actually have an, I have an answer to that question. How about that? Yeah. <laughs> There's a wonderful, I, I, don't, I, I hope I'm not violating anyone's copyright by doing this. I'm a little worried about, well, I'll just tell you in general. There's a wonderful technique um, that enables people to look back. And I, I, I'll just teach this to you in three minutes what I usually do like a seven hour workshop on. <laughs> How's that? <laughs> um, so uh, let me tell you as an adult. So it's a matter of thinking back on the best experiences of your life and thinking about, and you can, you can do this with kids. There's actually a curriculum on this and getting them to understand what their agency was. In other words, the question is, what did you do to make that happen? And to start seeing a pattern in what their strengths are by definition of what do they do that make good stuff happen around them? And by re realizing what their agency is, in other words, what they did to create, and it could be anything from, you know, the time that Fuzzy Wuzzy the kitten was complaining and no one but you could comfort them, you know, to getting a great grade on something. What did you do? And to pull those kinds of strengths out of them. Does that answer the question? I can't tell. Yeah, no, I think she was, you know, what do, what do we do as parents and educators if, um, history predicts history the child's history predicts to so but not just look back on their awards looking back on six on on meaningful uh good experiences they had like a vacation or you know friends or something what, what's their agency and that's going to be how you pull their 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 possibilities out Good. So then we had another question from Jen Strickland, and she was wondering how many of the presidential scholars have stated they've dealt with depression, divorce, or suicide, and were any of them considered underachievers? I, I know you've touched on the underachiever piece a little bit, but how many of them did, um, you know, say that they had dealt with depression or divorce? Yeah, you know, I didn't ask that question directly, and I can't answer for the group. But I can tell you that the pedestal phenomena was pervasive among a good number of people. Um, you know, if I had time, which I don't, I would run to my database and look for some really poignant descriptions. Um, the thing about this group is there was so much further to fall. And, you know, obviously there are other factors that factor into depression. You know, there's the biology, there's the you know, situation. Um, there were two known, two known suicides in my database, but I can't make any generalizations about that. I, I really can't, I'm so sorry. Um, you know, I mean, it's sort of, the, what my throwaway line used to be, they're just like the rest of us, but more so. I, I just don't know how else to say that in a substantive way. In my, I mean, if I do another st study, that maybe would be something I could address more directly, but that really wasn't anything that, that came out as a specific question. Sorry. No, that's perfect. And I think we'll just leave you with one more question. And it was a question we've been talking about before. Um, if you had one piece of advice to give a gifted adult, what would you, what would that piece of advice be? Well, I think it's to go back, uh, you know, and find the situations in which you had agency and that um, that it was something that you were good at and you sort of felt some pride at and that you could see the effects of your own hand, um, you know, working to make you happy. I, you know, I just, it's hard to know. I mean, the thing I learned from this study is there's no telling. When people have asked me, so what happens to gifted kids? It's sort of like, you can't make any assumptions. And I think I would give the same advice. You know, a lot of these presidential scholars had things happen in the world and in their own lives that you never could have predicted. So I guess if I were talking to a gifted adult, I would say, continue to expect, you know, the unexpected. You just never know.
That that's that is the takeaway. You're hearing it for the first time here. The takeaway message for the presidential scholars is you never know. How's that? Dr. Kaufman says it. <laughs> I'm entertaining myself, but anyway. Yeah. Um, and you're entertaining all of us as well. So we thank you so much. I know that there was some people who were wondering if they could reach out to you. Do you oh, have? Oh yeah. I'm a retired um, old lady. Feel free. <laughs> um, what is your email address? If you say it's it, totally you embarrassing. Um, in in real life, I'm still on AOL. That's how you know I'm in my seventies. <laughs> I'm on AOL. <laughs> so let me. Um, I have five addresses. Let me just think of which would be the best one. I'll give you two because some of you might be too embarrassed to write to AOL. <laughs> unless it's for grandma. So it's just my name, F. Kaufman. It's F-K-A-U-F-M-A-N-N -N at AOL.com. And the more grown-up professional address that I, you know, I do check is Dr. Kaufman one. It's D-R-K-A-U-F-M-A-N-N one at gmail.com, which thus proves that I am an adult. Well, there is never a doubt in our mind. <laughs> well, thank you so much, Dr. Kaufman. Um, thank you so everything. much. This was really fun. Yes. And thank you, everybody, for joining in for Conversations with CAG Team. Next week is Dr. Jaime Castellano. So we hope to see you back here next week. Thanks so much. Have a good night. Bye, y'all. Thank you.